everybody. Thank you all so much for being here. So we are here tonight, thank you for being here, uh, to hear Leo Rothstein, who's the co-author with her father, Richard Rothstein, of uh, Just Action, which is a sequel to The Color of Law, which was a groundbreaking, best-selling, great book. If you haven't read that, read that. It's over there. Bookshop Santa Cruz is here with books to sell, and Leo will be here to sign them afterwards. The bathrooms are right over there. The strawberries are not to be missed. <laughs> um, so uh, The Color of Law described how government policy created re residential segregation, and Just Action talks about how we can redress the wrongs of that and do something about it. We want to really thank our sponsors, UC uh, Center for Agroecology, that's where we are, the Friends of the UCSC Farm and Garden, which is uh, the organization that made this happen tonight, Bookshop Santa Cruz, thank you, yay, and a generous donation from the Santa Cruz Community Credit Union, also yay. So Ms. Rothstein has worked in public policy and community change uh, from a grassroots level to the halls of government. She's led the Alameda and San Francisco Probation Department's research on reforming community corrections policy and uh, practice to be focused on rehabilitation rather than punishment. She's worked as a consultant for nonprofit housing developers, for cities, for counties, redevelopment agencies, and private firms on community development and affordable housing policy, practice, and finance. Her policy work is informed by her years as a labor and community organizer. What hasn't she done? <laughs> Working on issues such as housing, environmental justice, workplace safety, and youth leadership. Leah received her bachelor's degree with honors in American studies from UCSC. Back home. And her master's degree in public policy from UC Berkeley. So with no further ado, welcome. <laughs> Hi, thank you all so much for being here. It's great to be back at UCSC. I tried to drive around before the talk, but I ran out of time. Um, I haven't been here in a long time. I have never seen this building, it's amazing. Um, so I am gonna spend some time talking about a little bit of the history, how we came to be a segregated, racially segregated society, and then uh, give some examples from our book, Just Action, about what we can do about it now. Um, so that's a little lay of the land of where I'm going. So I'm going to start by talking about this concept of de facto segregation. We've all probably heard of this uh, term. I know when I was in high school, what little I learned about the history of racial segregation, I learned it was a form of de facto segregation. So de facto segregation tells us that we are racially segregated in where we live because of personal preference, that we like to live around people who look like us, and so that's why we live in neighborhoods that are racially segregated and homogenous. Or the de facto segregation idea says that we're segregated because of private action. It was realtors or landlords or mortgage lenders who refused to sell or rent or give mortgages to African Americans to live in white neighborhoods, and so that's why we're racially segregated. And we tell ourselves it's different than the segregation of the South, the segregation of lunch counters and transportation, buses, schools that were required by law in the South. That was de jure segregation. So we, we've adopted this idea that re residential segregation is not de jure, it's de facto. It's um, something that happened by accident. Um, and when something is happened by accident, we think we can only undo it by accident and can only change by accident. There's no sort of role to play, no obligation to do anything about it. Well, this, this uh, idea has been very pervasive. It's you know, how we come to describe our society. The Supreme Court, as we know, has ascribed to this idea as well. Chief Justice John Roberts, years ago and very recently, has said that you know, the federal government has nothing to do, had nothing to do with creating racially segregated communities, so has no, no role to play in challenging that segregation. So very pervasive idea, this de facto segregation idea. So in 2017, my dad, Richard Rothstein, he wrote The Color of Law. 
the premise of that book was to prove that this de facto segregation idea was utter nonsense. That sure, there were private actors at play in creating segregated communities, but their actions were incentivized and often explicitly required by government at all levels to create the segregation we've now come to be used to. So the government action, federal, state, local government action, was as unconstitutional as the laws that segregated the South, as much of a violation of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments as those laws were. And sometimes it was less explicit. You know, the subtitle of Color of Law is a forgotten history of, I forget the rest of it, of how we came to be segregated or something like that. But the idea is that, you know, it was an explicit, it was explicit actions at the time. It wasn't hidden when the government did this. But we've forgotten how explicit and how intentional the segregation of our society was. And once we remember, once we're reminded of this history and we begin to reckon with it, we start to see that we have an obligation to do something about it because when our government takes such unconstitutional action, we have an obligation to remedy it and to remedy its impacts. But nobody stepped up to this obligation to remedy racial segregation. We just live with it. We think it's just something we have to deal with or it's just the way things are. Well, so one example from Color of Law. Color of Law, if you've read it, is filled with just uh, detail after detail of government actions that it's really sort of mind-blowing when you read it. I've heard a lot of people say they had to read it and sort of put it down and walk away from, for a while because it's just so overwhelming to hear about this history. But I'll give one example just to set the context. So after World War II, millions of war veterans came home from the war. They started families. We had the baby boom. There was a housing shortage because this was following the Great Depression and World War II. Not a lot of houses being, being built in the time, at that time. So the federal government wanted to do something to address the housing needs of these working families. And to do that, it decided to suburbanize the country. So we weren't a suburban country at the time. Most people lived in urban areas near factories and the businesses that supported those factories. They had to be near rail lines and ports. People had to be near their place of work because we didn't have the transportation systems. So people tended to live in urban areas. Well, the federal government wanted to move working families, particularly white working families, out of these urban areas into suburban communities. And they did that by offering federally backed loans to developers of suburban um, communities. And one famous example of that is Levittown outside of New York City. We've all probably heard of it. It was built by a developer named William Levitt. He decided he wanted to build 17,000 homes for workers in New York City who couldn't find a place to live. 17,000 homes is a lot of homes. He didn't have the money himself to pay for that kind of development. He couldn't get a bank loan because, as I said, we, were a suburban, we weren't a suburban economy. He didn't have buyers lined up. It seemed very speculative, so banks weren't really keen on lending him that money. The only way he could get a loan was getting this federally backed loan guarantee through the Federal Housing Administration. Now, the Federal Housing Administration gave these loan guarantees to William Levitt and builders like him all across the country on the explicit condition that they agreed that they would not ever sell their homes to anyone but whites. And this had to be written into the deeds of the homes that they built. And this wasn't you know, a secret. It was explicit government policy written in the Federal Housing Administration manual. And it said, and I'll quote, that they wouldn't provide these loan guarantees to suburban or um, suburban developments that were located anywhere near where African Americans lived because it would, quote, run the risk of infiltration by in inharmonious racial groups. So this was not, you know, an accident. It wasn't personal choice. There's a, a photo in the color of law of a wall in Detroit. It's six feet high, half mile long. It was required to be built by a developer of a nearby um, suburb or uh, subdivision because that subdivision was located too near a, ne a neighborhood where African Americans lived. So we had to build this wall to separate the two neighborhoods in order to get uh, the subsidy by the federal government to build his um, subdivision. So again, this concept of de facto segregation, it's just nonsense. Th this is just one of many, many examples of government action that was taken to intentionally ensure that blacks and whites did not live anywhere near each other. So William Levitt, he, he was a bigot. Um, at, you know, he wasn't shy about it. <laughs> he said at the time that if he was left to his own devices, he wouldn't sell his homes to African Americans. 
So, you know, that's, that's a thing to know. But the, the thing is, is that he wasn't left to his own devices, right? So if the federal government had told William Levitt and builders like him all over the country, you know, we'll give you this federally backed loan guarantee if you agree that you will sell your homes on a non-discriminatory basis, well, Levittown and suburbs all over the country would look very different than they do today. Levittown today has a population that's 2% African American in a surrounding area where 13% of the population is black. So that disparity is due to the policies in place when Levittown was created that subsidized whites to buy into those homes and explicitly prohibited African Americans from doing the same. So at the time when Levittown was built and the homes were sold to white families um, and suburbs like it all over the country, the homes were pretty affordable to working families. They cost $100,000 in today's money. That's unheard of in California, a price for a home, $100,000. But it's affordable to a working family of any race, and it was at the time as well. Whites could get uh, Federal Housing Administration loans that had low interest rates. Veterans who were white could get VA loans that had no down payment requirements. So these subdivisions, they were subsidized on the development side and on the home buyer side by the federal government. Now those homes, there are very few homes in suburban developments like that that you can buy for $100,000. They cost two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000, around here, a million or more. So those families who were subsidized to buy into those homes when they were affordable, they built up wealth over the generations as their homes appreciated in value. They could use that wealth to weather health emergencies, bouts of unemployment, go to school themselves, send their kids to college. They could then bequeath that wealth to their kids and grandkids to buy their own homes. This is how the transfer of intergenerational wealth has happened for whites in a way that African Americans were explicitly prohibited from doing, having that intergenerational wealth build up and transfer in the same way. So we talk about, you know, the, uh, in 1968, the Fair Housing Act was passed. It, it prohibited, um, prohibits discrimination in the sale or rental of housing. So some people say, okay, we're done with that. This history, it's history. It doesn't affect us anymore. But as we can see from this, just this one example about the suburban developments, it leads to a situation we have today where we have a huge wealth gap between African Americans and whites. So we have a, an income gap as well, which is sort of a subject of another talk, maybe another book. But there's a 60% income gap between average uh, African-American household income and average white household income. So average black household income is about 60% of average white household income. You would think that two households that make about the same amount of money should be able to save about the same amount of money, so the wealth gap should look like the income gap. But it doesn't. So the wealth gap, average, uh, African-American household wealth is 5% of white household wealth. And this huge disparity is due in large part to these policies that helped whites get into home ownership and build wealth that way and explicitly prohibited African-Americans from doing the same. So when we talk about uh, fair housing and anti-discrimination and ending segregation, we need to address these disparities that exist because of past government policy. It's not enough just to end future discrimination. We have to address sort of the consequences of the policies of the past that still affect our lives and affect people's opportunities and livelihoods going forward. So the, the wealth gap is one of those consequences of segregation and the policies that created segregation. There's many more. Um, segregated neighborhoods are the root cause of a lot of uh, disparities between blacks and whites, disparities in health outcomes, income, education. Children who grow up in segregated African American communities have higher rates of asthma. Those communities are closer to industries that pollute, closer to freeways. Um, so they have higher rates of asthma, they grow up to have higher cancer rates, um, shorter life expectancies, so the neighborhoods you live in determine your life outcomes, in including how long you will live. So the, these, uh, you know, when we talk about the segregation, uh, racial segregation of our communities, it's important to remember that it's not just a benign separation of people where some people are put here and some people here and everything's about the same. It's also the segregation of resources. So some communities are cleaner and healthier and places of higher opportunity, better access to good education, um, cleaner air, better you know, access to grocery stores, and other communities don't have that same access. So we can see that the consequences of segregation of these past government policies are still very much with us today and at, you know, underlie most of our most serious racial disparities and many of our most serious social problems in this country. 
So um, that's why we believe it's time to do something about it. So a lot of people read The Color of Law. Um, it was a surprise bestseller. Nobody thought anybody would be that interested in this intricate history of our country, but they were. Over a million people have read it. And as a result, this de facto segregation idea, it has less currency in our country today, which is kind of amazing. We, the conversation has really changed, yeah. Go, go dad. <laughs> he really has had a humongous impact on the country, it's amazing. Um, so because of that, the conversation shifting, you know, we can see more clearly what has caused the segregation of our country, and we can see more clearly the costs that we all bear because of that. So a lot of people read that book, came to his lectures like this one. I was one of those people. I was in the audience at one of his lectures at Berkeley, and I came up to him afterwards, as many people did, I heard later, and said, you know, this is amazing that we're now being, you know, waking up to this history. It's incredible, the research that went into this book, and I feel inspired. I understand we now that we have an obligation to do something about it, but what do we do? You know, and I had a background in community organizing and housing policy, but I still didn't see a clear way forward to really redress segregation and remedy its impacts because it feels like an overwhelming issue. It's overwhelming. It feels like just the way things are. We'll never be able to change it. So my dad, in dad fashion, <laughs> took my question and said, well, why don't you help me answer that question? And so uh, eventually I agreed and we wrote this book to help answer that question of what we can do, what can we do now to begin to remedy and challenge segregation, given that it's so intractable and so overwhelming and such a big issue. So I'll give a few examples from Just Action, but first I'll sort of set the context that we uh, set up in the book. And that is, first we argue that in order to make any movement and progress on this issue, we need a new uh, national activated civil rights movement to take on this issue. And you know, it might feel like we're sort of steps in that direction in the last few years because you know, there was a racial reckoning in 2020. After George Floyd's murder, 20 million people came out to Black Lives Matter demonstrations all over the country. That's more people than have ever marched in racial justice marches or demonstrations in this country's history. So it felt like a new day was dawning on these issues. And th these were people from urban and suburban areas. They were black, white, Latino, Asian, they were young and old. There were all kinds of people. 20 million people is a lot of people, can do a lot of, of good. But many of those people after these demonstrations, granted it was, it was COVID, we were in a pandemic, but we all went home and many of us, you know, we put lawn signs up on our front lawns, we maybe started book clubs, we read more books about racial justice. Uh, some of our companies, you know, issued letters to their shareholders denouncing racism and promising to do better, do different. They hired DEI officers. So this, you know, there's a lot of this going on. Um, it's, these are all good things. It's good to sort of reckon with our past, to raise awareness, to, uh, for companies to recognize their role in this. You know, this is all important. But it, these things didn't then go, to, go on to lead to really actionable steps that could begin to challenge the segregation of our communities. We think one of the reasons is because we didn't know what to do. It's not clear how to do that. And one reason is that, you know, we tend to think, and I've gotten the sense just talking to people all over the country about this book, that we have to start with federal policy change. Like the federal government needs to change what they're doing so we can really see change on this issue. Now we understand that to have true national you know, change on segregation, to really desegregate the country nationally, we will need federal policy change. We'll need federal policy interventions and investments, massive in investments all over the country. But we also know that we don't have the political will on the federal level to do this. You know, we're so polarized on the federal level, we can't expect that change to happen anytime soon. But we can build that political will in our own local communities. And there's communities doing that all over the country. So in Just Action, we give dozens of examples of uh, issues, strategies, uh, policies that local groups can take on. And then we, we describe a group that's actually doing it, that's successfully implementing it somewhere in the country. So it is happening, and it is possible to do locally. So that's why we focus on purely local action. You know, the federal government had a large role to play in creating segregation, but once that was created, it's a lot of local action, local policies and programs that maintain and perpetuate segregation. So there's a lot we can do locally that will have big impacts. 
So that's not to say it will be easy, <laughs> but um, it's certainly not impossible. So to build this, these local groups, this new national activated civil rights movement, we believe we need to start by building groups in our own communities that are biracial and multi-ethnic. We need to have leadership that's both white and African American. We need to come together and be able to build social relationships to base the, the work that we'll do together to challenge segregation on those relationships. And we also understand that this is daunting in itself because we live in very segregated communities, so we don't have a lot of natural social contact with people of other races often. Sometimes in our workplaces we do, but often we live in communities and the people we're in contact with look like us. And so it takes a little extra effort to create these biracial committees and create relationships across races. So we give some examples of communities that have done that, uh, groups that have taken a little extra effort, taken that intentional step to build these cross-race relationships, and they're really great stories. I won't go into one now because I have a lot to get through, but maybe in the Q&A I can tell you uh, a really cool story from Chicago about that. But just to show again that it's, it's not impossible to bring people from different parts of a city together who live in segregated neighborhoods, maybe don't know about the other side of town, to learn about each other and begin to build some social capital with which they can then advocate for change in their, in their local community. So then the, the change to advocate for, what are those policies and strategies? Well, they do a few different things. Um, we talk about the redress of segregation, and we use that word to mean that we both need to ensure that we don't continue to create and perpetuate segregation of our communities, so change whatever policies we need to change or enact whatever programs we need to enact to ensure that we desegregate communities going forward. And then we also need to, like I mentioned earlier, address the, the harms of the past and remedy the disparities that exist and the consequences of segregation. We need both of those things to truly redress segregation and move forward. So to do those things, uh, we group our strategies into two main categories. The first are those strategies that are concerned with increasing investments in lower income, segregated African American communities where the concentration of poverty is a direct result of government-sponsored segregation. So like I said before, segregation is not just the separation of people, but the segregation of resources. So these underserved, segregated African-American neighborhoods lack the resources they need to be places of high opportunity for their residents. So to redress segregation, we want to make those neighborhoods places of more resources and higher investment. Now when we do that, it's inevitable that as those kinds of neighborhoods increase their investments and have more amenities and better um, opportunity, that people with higher incomes will want to move in, gentrification happens, and those people with higher incomes can pay higher prices for those homes and they displace the longtime residents of those communities. Now we don't think that because that happens we should not invest in those communities. Instead we should invest in those communities and couple those strategies with anti-displacement strategies to prevent some of the displacement that will inevitably happen. So those strategies can be like rent regulation that um, protect rent renters from rapidly increasing rents or just cause eviction ordinances that make it illegal to evict tenants except for a just cause or inclusionary zoning policies, which require that when new housing is built in a community, which often happens in a gentrifying community, you know, condos come up, market rate condos pop up all over the place. If there's a, an inclusionary zoning policy, it requires that in those market rate developments, a certain percentage of the units have to be reserved and sold or rented for at affordable prices to lower and moderate income households. So in that way, affordable housing is being created as market rate housing is being created and that can prevent some displacement by, by preserving some affordable home, home ownership or rental opportunities for people who live in that community and are at risk of displacement. So one example I'll go into a little more detail on for one of these sort of anti-displacement and increased investment strategies is a community land trust. There is one, I believe, is there a community land trust in Santa Cruz that isn't just, that's not the land preservation? I think there's a land preservation one. So community land trusts are slightly different than the land trusts that are concerned with conserving and preserving open space and agricultural land. Community land trusts are, there's over 300 around the country in 300 communities, so they're gaining a lot of traction. They started out of the civil rights movement in the South, and they're a model, it's a nonprofit organization, 
And the, the goal of a land trust, a community land trust, is to create permanently affordable home ownership opportunities in communities often where prices are rising, like gentrifying communities and residents are at risk of displacement. So it can prevent displacement and create affordable home ownership opportunities for people who otherwise wouldn't be able to buy their first home. Um, so the way a land trust does this is it first acquires property, and usually this is done because a local government will donate vacant or unused land to a land trust. And I, I was surprised to learn this when I was an affordable housing development consultant, but local governments are sitting on a lot of vacant, unused land all over cities and suburbs all over the country. So they can donate some of this land to a land trust, and the land trust then fixes up the house on it or builds a house, usually volunteer labor or in-kind donations, and then they sell those homes at affordable prices to lower and moderate income families, and they can sell them at affordable prices because the land trust retains ownership of the land underneath the house. So the you know housing costs keep rising. One of the main reasons for the rising cost of housing is that land costs keep rising because we're constrained by land. When the supply is constrained, the prices go up. So when you take um, the land cost out of the equation, the house itself is more affordable. So then the homeowners, they own the home like any other homeowner does. They ground lease the land from the land trust and for you know a dollar a year or something negligible. They pay their mortgage, taxes, insurance, um, you know, they, they're like any other homeowner. And then when they want to resell their home, they have to adhere to a maximum resale price that the land trust establishes. And every land trust has a slightly different formula for determining that maximum resale price. But so that maximum res resale price, it's called a limited equity uh, model. So the, it balances two, two goals, and one is to uh, earn some equity for the home selling family. So they won't earn as much as if they sell, sold it for market rate, but they earn some. And it's not insignificant often what they earn in that sale. And, and that is balanced with the need to keep the house price affordable to the next home buying family. So that's how it creates permanently affordable home ownership opportunities. So we talk about, in Just Action, we talk about a group in Durham, North Carolina that started a land trust. They started in a lower income, predominantly African American community in Durham. They started when neighbors just started talking to each other about what they wanted to do to improve conditions in their neighborhood. And they started, people identified that their neighborhood didn't have a park and kids were playing in the street and a child had been hit by a car, so they wanted a park in their neighborhood. And they advocated that the city turn a vacant lot into a park and they won, they got their park and so the group got excited, oh, we, if we can win a park, what else can we do in our neighborhood? Their neighborhood was gentrifying because they were near Duke University, which was expanding, and investors were buying up houses and displacing residents. So they learned about the land trust model and they started one. They started with two houses that the local government donated the, the vacant homes to and they fixed them up and they sold them for, at affordable prices, $100,000 in today's money to two lower moderate income households. And you know, then those homes, now the Land Trust has over 300 properties all around Durham, not just in this neighborhood. They have for sale and they have rental properties. The, their for sale homes now sell for about $150,000. So we can see how that formula, by building up some equity for the home, buy, home sellers, it decreases the affordability somewhat. It went from 100 dollars to $150,000, but homes in the surrounding neighborhood sell for $500,000. So they're far more affordable than market rate homes. And in the blocks where the land trust was able to acquire properties, most of the residents are still African American. The blocks where they weren't, where investors outpaced the land trust, most of the residents are now white. So we can see that the land trust was both an effective anti-displacement strategy where it was able to acquire properties and also an effective way of creating affordable home ownership opportunities that last, that uh, are in perpetuity affordable. Um, so what can we do with this example? Well, we can help start a land trust in our own community if one doesn't exist or if one exists, support it uh, uh, personally, individually, with resources or time. But most importantly is always what we can do collectively, right? And that is to pressure our local governments to donate vacant land to a land trust, to support a land trust in, in uh, increasing its portfolio of homes. 
And another way we can do this is going back to those restrictive covenants like Levitt, the homes that Levittown had. You know, the restrictive covenants were a primary tool of the federal government in the mid 20th century for creating segregated communities. They were written into the deeds of homes that said that the home could only ever be owned or occupied by whites. So those covenants are no longer legally enforceable, but they're written into the deeds of homes and they stay on those deeds forever. It's like the property line that you can't just erase it. It doesn't just go away even though it's not legally enforceable. So those deeds that have those racially restrictive covenants, they often also name all of the companies that were involved in the development of that home. So the builder that built it, the developer of the subdivision, the bank that financed it, the realtor that first sold the home. Often, surprisingly, those businesses are still operating in our communities. So we looked into some in Charlottesville, Virginia. The companies named on those deeds are still operating in that city. And the few that aren't still operating have been acquired by other businesses that are operating. So a group organized to redress segregation of their community could identify these companies and institutions and pressure them to contribute to remedies for the segregation that they helped to create. One of those remedies could be supporting a land trust through financial donations or donat donations of land. So this is another thing we can do. So the other type of strategies we talk about are what are called mobility strategies or those that attempt to open up exclusive, usually predominantly white communities, usually expensive communities, often suburbs, to diverse residents. So part of desegregating, our country is desegregating those communities as well. There's a lot of ways we can do that. Changing zoning, for example, which California is doing statewide to um, outlaw single family only zoning to allow more diverse uh, housing types in those suburban communities that can provide a diversity of affordability options of homes and hopefully, potentially, a diversity of residents. Now, we argue there should be preferences on top of those um, uh, rezoning efforts to ensure that the, the rezoning is a tool for desegregation, racial preferences, but we can get into that later. <laughs> um, other strategies for this category are subsidies for African Americans to move into these neighborhoods, rental subsidies, home ownership subsidies. Inclusionary zoning can also work in these kinds of areas. And building housing in these communities that are affordable not only to very low income and upper income people, but to what we call the missing middle. So middle income families that earn too much to qualify for subsidized low income housing and don't earn enough to afford market rate housing. In California, many of us are in this missing middle category given housing prices right now. So when we build new housing in these communities, we, we want to keep in mind to ensure that some of it is affordable to that missing middle group. One strategy I'll go into a little more detail now uh, for this kind of uh, this category it involves the Section 8 rental housing choice voucher rental voucher program. It's a um, federally funded program and administered by local public housing agencies. It's the largest rental subsidy program in the country. Two million low income households who are disproportionately African American receive Section 8 vouchers. And Section 8 vouchers are, you know, unlike a public housing recipient whose benefit is tied to a unit, it's tied to a building in a public housing project, um, a, with a Section 8 voucher, the recipient can use that voucher to rent anywhere in the private market. So they have mobility opportunities. And the Section 8 program, when it was uh, formed, it had the intention and, you know, has the potential to allow low-income tenants to leave high poverty areas, to move to areas of what are called high opportunity neighborhoods. Most of us want to live in these kinds of neighborhoods. They have well-resourced public schools, access to open space, access to jobs and transportation, healthy air, grocery stores, banks. You know, it's a, a functioning, high, uh, healthy community. Children who grow up in these types of neighborhoods do better. Parents are happier. They have less stress and depression. But these high opportunity areas are often also high cost areas, right? So lower income people can't afford to live in these areas. The Section 8 program has the potential to address that by allowing, um, by providing a, a subsidy for these renters to live in higher cost areas. But only 5% of Section 8 voucher holders live in high opportunity neighborhoods. Only 5% nationwide. Uh, so that's not really living up to its potential, <laughs> this program. 
and white Section 8 uh, tenants are far more likely to live in high opportunity areas than African American Section 8 holders. One reason for this is discrimination. So the federal government doesn't recognize, uh, doesn't prohibit discrimination against Section 8 tenants. Um, they, it's an allowed form of discrimination by the federal government. So there's that. <laughs> but there's um, you know, about 20 states and over 100 cities and counties that have outlawed this kind of discrimination. California has statewide with what's called a source of income discrimination law. So it says it's illegal to discriminate against someone, against a tenant, because of where their income comes from. If it comes from a federal subsidy, you can't discriminate against them because of that. Well, as we may know, these kinds of anti-discrimination laws are only good as, as good as their enforcement. So many places where these laws are in place, there's still rampant discrimination against Section 8 tenants. So what we need is education of landlords and tenants to know that this kind of discrimination is illegal. And then we need monitoring and enforcement to find out where it's happening and then enforce the laws where it is occurring. One way to do that is uh, work that often falls to fair housing organizations. So many communities, regions have fair housing organizations, also nonprofits, also often underfunded. So they can use our support to do this work. We can also individually volunteer with a fair housing organization to help tease out where this discrimination is occurring. And here's how that works. So when a fair housing organization tries to test out where discrimination is happening, they do what's called paired testing. And they send two potential tenants to a unit that's advertised as being available. The tenants have similar qualifications. One is white, one is African American. Some say they use Section 8, some say they don't. And sometimes the people are treated very differently. Some, is, some are shown the unit, some are told it's already been rented. So that's how we can find where, that's the only way we can really know when discrimination is occurring. So fair, fair housing organizations do this kind of paired testing and then they can uh, enforce you know, where discrimination is occur occurring, prosecute to the extent that the law allows um, those landlords that are discriminating against Section 8 tenants or discriminating against African Americans in general. But fair housing organizations, as I said, underfunded, can't you know, pay people to do this kind of testing. So we can volunteer as testers for fair housing organizations to help see where discrimination is occurring. So that's another thing we can do locally to help advance um, fair housing and anti-discrimination efforts and the redress of segregation. So the voucher amount itself is another obstacle to voucher tenants living in higher cost areas. And even though the voucher, like I said, had the potential to allow low-income tenants to live in high-cost areas. The way the program works is when you get a, a Section 8 voucher, you pay 30% of your monthly income, no matter what your monthly income is, towards your rent, and the voucher pays the difference up to a maximum amount set by uh, HUD and the local public housing authority. So that maximum voucher amount is usually set by the median rent of a metropolitan area's rent. So you take a whole metropolitan area, um, here, I think, is this in the San Jose metro area? No. In San, it, oh, it's its own. Okay. So even in, in this uh, metro area, there's a wide span of rents, right? Very high to very low. And the median is the rent right in the middle. You go 10% below that, and that's the maximum rent a voucher will pay anywhere in the metropolitan area. So by definition, 60% of the rents in the metro area are out of reach of voucher holders. So it's not surprising that voucher holders can't use their vouchers to move to higher cost areas because there's this built-in obstacle. So um, in 2010, there was a lawsuit about this uh, payment voucher payment standard in Dallas. And that lawsuit alleged that this payment standard, it caused the segregation and isolation of African American and Latino voucher holders into high poverty areas. And so therefore it should be, it was uh, challenged through this lawsuit. As a result of the lawsuit, the housing authorities in the Dallas area adopted a different payment standard. It's called the small area fair market rent standard. So instead of taking the median of the whole metro area, they take the median of smaller areas, a zip code or a group of zip codes. So in higher cost areas of the Dallas region, a voucher will pay more than in lower cost areas, which makes sense. It like, makes logical sense that it should work that way. And as a result of that change, voucher holders had a lot more uh, ability to move out of high poverty areas into higher opportunity areas. So that was in 2010. And since then, um, the federal government through HUD has required 180 housing authorities in 24 metropolitan areas around the country 
the only one in California is San Diego that's required to do this, um, to use these small area rent standards. But every other housing authority anywhere else in the country can voluntarily adopt to, to use these small area rent standards. I've talked to several housing authorities that have done this um, on their own volition, you know, because they saw that it would help make um, their, their lives better for their clients and help make them uh, able to access more units throughout their metropolitan region. So this is another thing. If we had a group locally working to redress segregation, could work with the local public housing authorities and advocate that they adopt the small area rent standard to allow voucher holders the more access to higher opportunity areas. So that's um, an example of a strategy, a mobility strategy that can open up exclusive expensive areas to diverse residents. And I talked about a land trust as an example uh, that's often used in lower income segregated communities or gentrifying communities. That's because that's usually where land trusts can get a local government or others to donate land or where they can acquire land. But if a land trust could acquire land in an exclusive, expensive suburban community, it would be a fantastic uh, strategy for opening up that community to people who've historically been excluded from that community. And so what those communities need is groups in suburban communities as well advocating that their local suburban government use their vacant land in that way, donate some of it to a land trust to open up their community to more diverse residents. And again, there's no lack of opportunity for this. Suburban governments are also sitting on a lot of vacant land. We talk in Just Action about a couple of examples in Modesto. There's uh, the city now owns a golf course that went out of business. So a huge piece of land they're trying to figure out what to do with. <laughs> and, th and they're not alone. In um, Woodbridge, Connecticut, the town owns a country club that went out of business, also trying to figure out what to do with this land. And in suburbs around the country, public school enrollment has been declining. And so there's vacant schools, vacant school sites. And so these local governments can use some of this vacant land by donating parcels to a land trust to create permanently affordable home ownership opportunities. Now we argue again that to ensure that this is a tool for desegregating those communities and remedying the past harms that explicitly prohibited African Americans from buying into these communities, that those units in the land trust should have preferences for African Americans to um, access those units for it to really be a tool for desegregation of those areas. Okay, so those are the two main categories of strategies that we talk about. And just really quickly, I'll go into another, so, you know, you make categories and you try to get everything to fit and they don't. So there's other ones that don't fit into those categories. And those include efforts that um, increase home ownership opportunities for African Americans in all kinds of neighborhoods. Any neighborhood they want to live in, um, increase their access to home ownership. So I talked about the restrictive covenants as an example of an explicit uh, way that African Americans were explicitly denied the opportunity to own homes when those covenants were in place. No longer legally enforceable, we get that, but there are other ways that are still, things, programs, practices that are still in effect today that have, they're maybe not explicitly, uh, you know, racial, they don't have a racially explicit uh, intent, but they have a racially uh, discriminatory effect. So one of those is the credit scoring system. We think of the credit scoring system as something that is objective. It's an algorithm, so it must be true, right? It tells a bank that, uh, based on our financial history, um, it tells a bank if we're a good candidate for a mortgage. So if you have a high credit score, you're more likely to get approved for a mortgage, get a better interest rate. You have a high credit score if your financial history is good, if you haven't defaulted on loans in the past. That makes some sense. But the kind of financial history that a credit score is based on is only a certain type of financial history. It's a type of financial history that whites are far more likely to have than African Americans. A couple of reasons for that. One is that African American communities, all uh, economic levels of African American communities have fewer bank branches than white communities of similar economic status just uh, discrimination, plain and simple, by banks. So with less access to traditional financial institutions, people in those neighborhoods have to rely on non-traditional financial instruments like payday lenders. And payday lenders, as we know, have really exorbitant interest rates on their loans. Even if you pay back your loan in full with that hugely high, ridiculous interest rate, that doesn't benefit you towards your credit, credit score because credit scores don't take account of these non-traditional financial institutions. So that's one reason. Another reason is that 
If you've been a homeowner in the past and you've paid your mortgage faithfully on time, haven't missed a mortgage payment, that gets fed into the credit scoring system. You get benefit of that towards your credit score. But if you're applying for a mortgage and you haven't owned a home in the past, which is more likely to be true for African Americans than for whites, and you've paid your rent on time your whole life, you've been a renter your whole life, never missed a rent payment, never missed a utility bill payment, these are all things that are easily traceable, but they're not, they don't feed into the credit scoring system. So you don't get a benefit of that in your credit score if you've been a good renter and had that kind of good financial history. So as a result, we have this racially discriminatory effect of this race-neutral policy. And that is that um, about 30% of African Americans have no credit score at all. They're, um, I forget the word for it, when you have no credit score, you don't have the kind of financial history that would even create a credit score. That's compared to 17% of whites. And of those with credit scores, about a quarter of African Americans don't uh, have a credit score high enough to qualify them for a mortgage, compared to over half of whites. So this is, you know, huge disparities that exist that really limit the home ownership opportunities of African Americans. If you can't get a mortgage, you can't buy a home. Um, and so this is something that we can address locally as well. The credit scoring system is a national system. There are conversations and movement on the federal level to change the system to uh, account for rental payment history. Those conversations have been going for, I think, 15 years, and the pilot program just started. So if we wait for federal policy change, you know, we wait a long time. But it, while we're waiting for that, we can affect change locally. And we describe in Just Action some local bank branches and credit unions that have started to adjust how, they've, how they calculate credit scores to take into account rental payment history goes a long way of opening up home ownership opportunities for African Americans. So that's another thing we can do in our own communities is work with our local um, financial in institutions to adjust their credit scoring algorithms to have a more comprehensive view of people's credit history. Okay, so those are some examples. I could talk forever. There's like <laughs> so many more in the book, but I will stop now so that we have time for questions. And um, I'll just wrap up by saying that you know, I started this project uh, of writing this book not sure that there was really anything we could do. And I have come out of it, um, despite sort of the, you know, political context we're living in right now, I remain hopeful that there is a lot that can be done. And there are people all over the country working on this. And, you know, just like The Color of Law described all of these little pieces that went into creating segregation, it takes a lot of pieces and a lot of smaller incremental change to begin to challenge and undo it. And so um, it sort of doesn't matter how we get started, just that we do get started somewhere. So thank you so much for being here and listening. <laughs> There are a lot of people in this room who work in the field of equity and inclusiveness um, in Santa Cruz and have a lot to contribute to the conversation. So questions, and I have a little microphone for you. Could we? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. Uh, Judith Camacho, and uh, I have the pleasure of working with Life Lab here on the farm. You're all welcome mm -hmm. to come back. Um, I have two questions, one related to the first book. and I haven't read either of them, so I'm just going to sh share that, and the one related to the second one. And that is the first question um, with the color of law. I'm interested in knowing whether the um, segregated laws that were put in place, specifically when you were referring to um, building suburban areas, whether the law specifically was just anti-African um, American or whether it was anti-Native, Latino, and other communities. So that's the first question. And then the second question has to do with, I'm really interested in knowing if there are community land trusts um, around the country that have addressed specifically the needs of Native communities. Um. So the restrictive covenants I talked about, they vary across the country in their language. So some of them are explicit about the races they're excluding. All of them exclude African Americans. Um, some also exclude Asians, Hispanics, Jews. Um, some just say only whites can live here. Um, so they vary in the language. 
But the other policies that are outlined and detailed in color of law have, were very explicitly targeted at African Americans. And so we understand, you know, there is uh, other races have experienced segregation and the impacts of segregation, but the laws that have created the segregation for Latinos and, and other communities are very different from the laws that have created and maintained the segregation of the black community. And as, you know, Latino communities, third generation and beyond, tend to desegregate and integrate into other communities, whereas African American segregation uh, main, is maintained generation after generation. And that's because of these very explicit laws that targeted that race um, explicitly and uniquely. And so our book is very focused on black-white segregation and addressing that because, uh, you know, we really believe that these, uh, these explicit government policies have explicit remedies and we have to tie our remedies to those actions. So it doesn't mean that there aren't actions that can be taken to address discrimination and segregation of other races, but that would be a different book that someone else can write, you know, and, that, and the, those would be important too. And there, a lot of the strategies that we talk about will um, have beneficial impacts on the segregation of other races as well, but we try to be very specific to tie our remedies to the harms that were caused. So that's why I, uh, my talk sounds like this and, and our book is the way it is. Um, as to your other question, I don't know the answer to that question. I imagine that there are uh, land trusts that are focused explicitly on native populations and communities. Um, I don't know uh, who they are or where they're operating, but I do know there was just an article in the New York Times today about community land trusts, about how they're proliferating and talked about some, you know, how varied they are. Um, and some are working on commercial development. You know, um, Another thing I got out of that article, which is fascinating, is that some elderly homeowners who um, can't really afford the upkeep of their home, but their home has increased in value so much since they bought it, they're donating their home to a land trust where the land trust buys it from them for a fraction of the market cost so that they can afford the upkeep of their home. And then when they die, their, their home will become a land trust property. So they're basically bequeathing their home to a land trust, which is really cool. <laughs> um, and that article talked about, I think, someone in Marin who's doing that. So um, there's a, group, a national group called Grounded Solutions that's kind of the hub of land trusts around the country, and they have a lot of um, resources for starting one and how to run one, and I'm sure you could find there uh, where they exist and what sort of explicit focuses they have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no? I can just say that. Uh, there is yeah. an article there's, there's in, um, oh, there is an article um, in the, it's a national profit management or national, nonprofit, nonprofit quarterly, quarterly, excuse me, that talks about um, indigenous land trust oh. work. There you go. Thank you. Can you tell us what you did? <laughs> so my name is Katrina Moore Richardson. I'm an organizational development a consultant that works um, explicitly on racial equity with social justice organizations across the nation. <laughs> Community building. <laughs> okay, There's not there. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I'm wondering if you can go back to preferences. Um, we live in Oakland, and there's a lot of neighborhoods like North Oakland and West Oakland where there were um, a lot of African American families that have been gentrified out. And so if a nonprofit or a land trust wanted to have preference for this must be rented or owned by African Americans, is that legal now, or how do we get there? Um, and yeah, I think that's my question. Very timely question. It is uh, not exactly legal now. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the Supreme Court just ruled against affirmative action, having racial preferences in college admissions. A lot of people expect that to expand to other programs. Even before that decision, um, many who design and implement these programs are uh, have been hesitant to put race preferences on anything because of the fear that that would be determined as racial discrimination and therefore in violation of the Fair Housing Act. Now, there's uh, a, I have a couple ways of answering this. One is we have a chapter in our book called Dare to Defy, where we lay out the history of the Supreme Court's decisions when it comes to racial equity and advancing racial equity. 
and they have, except for a very short period, always uh, prevented the advancement of racial equity in Supreme Court decisions, often based on a faulty history of how we came to be, uh, you know, ha have this racial inequity that we have. And so when they base these decisions on faulty history, we believe that we have an obligation to defy their decisions and implement these remedies that are necessary to remedy the past unconstitutional acts of our government. And to remedy race-specific crimes, we need race-specific solutions. So we understand, I understand that that is a tall order. It takes a lot of courage. Um, a lot of people starting these programs or implementing them don't want to do that. They don't want to be sued. Um, now, being sued is another way of advancing the cause, right? We could then develop new case law about it. It could be appealed. This is how things are changed. Um, and, and we also, you know, point out that, you know, in the civil rights movement, many of the actions that were taken were against the law. And there's oftentimes, you know, in the abortion debate where we defy Supreme Court decision when we don't agree with it, and that then leads to policy change. So um, we do, I recognize, you know, the tall order that this is, but we advocate for having the courage to defy these, um, these fears that we would be in violation of the law by having racial preferences. Now, aside from that, <laughs> there are a lot of ways that programs um, aren't, you know, stepping up entirely to have race preferences, but having workarounds. So Oakland, for example, has a, um, I believe it's a first-time homebuyer assistance program, and they have a preference for displaced residents. So uh, residents who have had to leave Oakland because they were priced out, or they have a list of reasons, or they're at risk of that. So this is, you know, it's a workaround. It's not race specific, but it's a way of, of um, trying to get at the, the communities of color in Oakland who are being displaced by gentrification. There's other workarounds, and, and you know, we, being race neutral won't have the same impact as being race specific in these solutions, but they are still useful. So a lot of um, down payment assistance programs have, they're advocating from switching to first time home buyers to first generation home buyers to try to reach even more African American families. Um, and then there are, you know, uh, local governments that are implementing race specific solutions and they haven't yet been sued or challenged. Evanston, Illinois has a rep, they're calling it a reparations program for African American residents who, um, you know, were discriminated against historically in, in that town and now they can access a down payment assistance program or uh, funds for education or small business. Um, spending, I believe those are the categories. Another one that um, has been enacted very recently, which I think is very interesting, is in Washington State, and they there have um, researched the racially restrictive covenants in the state and the extent that there were racial covenants throughout Washington State and use that to um, justify creating a down payment assistance grant program. So it's a interest-free loan for down payment assistance for anyone um, who lived in Washington State when racially restrictive covenants were in effect, so you know, early uh, 20th century, or whose uh, parents or grandparents did. So it's not race-specific, it's, it's called, they're calling it harm-based, but the harm was race-based, so it's like a workaround to then uh, provide assistance to remedy that um, past. So I think that's an interesting program. And they're funding it by adding a $100 charge on every real estate transaction in the state. So um, it's, it's, I think, an exciting program, and we'll see how it goes. But that can, you know, there, so there are these workarounds. They're not going to be as effective at really addressing the racial impact, but they can be effective still. So, mm -hmm. We have time for a couple more questions, comments? Anybody learn anything? Hey, <laughs> there's one. <laughs> Walk all the way up. Hi. Oh, that's loud. <laughs> uh, my name is Ursula. I uh, work here on campus um, in the Latin American and Latino Studies Department. Um, as some of you may be aware, students are having a hard time affording housing here in Santa Cruz, um, as are many folks. And I wonder if there are any universities or university towns that are addressing that issue for kind of young people or students specifically. 
I get that question in every university town. <laughs> um, and I don't know uh, any you know, great examples or answers, but there's a lot of ideas out there. You know, um, universities own a lot of land, and so that is a way they can have some control, you know, donating land like to a land trust, for example, to build affordable student housing or implementing some kind of inclusionary zoning requirement on the land that they own that requires that some of it is used to build affordable um, student housing. So any, any other way that a land owner, like a government, can regulate how housing is built, um, universities could also try to do. Um, now, we all know that you know, getting the university or the UC system to change course isn't easy, but you know, it's worth trying. And, um, and I can tell you that every town I've been in in California that has a UC asks this question. So there's you know, interest out there to build, we could build a movement on that can do something about this. But yeah, it's obviously a problem everywhere. I think so. The co-ops in Berkeley. Yeah, yeah. Berkeley, a lot of the student housing is through these vast dormitory co-ops. And I think they're independent. They're open actually to all, not just Berkeley students, but any college student in the Bay Area can apply and mm. get a, a housing there. And um, I, th yeah. So, uh, but I don't really know the legality of how they're set up and stuff. Yeah, I don't. I'm not familiar either with how they're set up, but. That does bring up a point. So Berkeley is trying to build a lot of new student housing, and residents of Berkeley are trying to stop them. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. And they're coming up with interesting ways of trying to stop it, like using the noise of student housing as an environmental impact. Um, so, uh, you know, this. Uh, Anytime we talk about increasing housing supply, increasing affordable housing, increasing multifamily housing, there's going to be resistance by local residents. Um, the, the resistance is often called NIMBYism, so it stands for not in my backyard, people who say that they support affordable housing until it's proposed in their neighborhood, and then they make sure that it can't happen. So. Um, you know, we write about this too. This is an important part of the puzzle. We can't, you know, forget that there's going to be opposition to a lot of these strategies. And we also argue that um, just as there's a vocal opposition, we believe that there's a lot of local support also, and they're just not organized and not coming out to the meetings. They're sometimes not organized. <laughs> And it's also, you know, often the, the people who will benefit from the new housing don't yet live in the community. They might not know that they're going to benefit from that housing, so they're not showing up at the planning commission meetings, whereas the people who live around them think they're going to be negatively impacted. They think they're going to be, so they show up and oppose it. Um, and I'll just give another a plug for we're writing a substack column to continue to write about these issues because they're always changing and we want to keep writing about examples that can give people ideas and inspiration from around the country. Um, so it's justaction.substack.com. You can subscribe for free. And um, I wrote a column recently about uh, Menlo Park community. So Menlo Park is very expensive. Median home price there is over $2 million. It's an exclusive, mostly white community. They started um, talking about these issues after The Color of Law came out. There's a piece in, in The Color of Law about that region of California. And so they were inspired to do more research about how Menlo Park itself came to be segregated. And they ended up developing a training, a workshop that they did all over their town and started to develop an understanding in their region about how they came to be segregated and how it wasn't an accident that their community looks the way it does and has the affordability crisis that it has. And while they're doing this and building this organization, um, you know, they, they were building an organization and for people to join, they had to agree with the values of inclusion and diversity of their community. So while they're doing this, um, a local school district uh, proposed to build teacher housing on a vacant school site. It owned 90 units of teacher housing. 30% of teachers in that community left their jobs every year because they couldn't live anywhere nearby. So the school district wanted to do something about it. Neighbors opposed it. Who would oppose teachers? No. <laughs> but they did. <laughs> and, and this was a site that wasn't, anyway, they opposed it. They didn't like it. They wanted um, to stop this and any other multifamily development. So they put a measure on the ballot 
that would have made this development impossible and made any future rezoning of a single family lot uh, have to go before the voters. So it would make it almost impossible or you know, financially impossible to build any multifamily housing in this area. Well, this group had already been talking about this and they could see that this was another you know, step in a series of policies that created and maintained their community segregation and they didn't want to stand for it. So they started a door-to-door -door organizing campaign where they talked to voters. They went out every weekend, um, knocked on doors, and they talked to all the voters in their community. And I talked to some of the leaders of this campaign and they told me how they would you know, stand in front of a home and be like, this person isn't gonna be on our side, but I have to knock anyway. And then they'd start to talk to them and realize that they actually were supportive, that people didn't like how their community had become so exclusive, that their teachers couldn't live there, their kids couldn't move back home. You know, they wanted to do something about it. So they defeated the measure that actually didn't pass. And so this is, I like to talk about this example because if Menlo Park could do it, you know, <laughs> anyone can do it. And, and, and it's an example of, yeah, we're gonna face opposition. There's gonna be people who oppose us and don't want this to happen, but there are people out there who are supportive and can turn out and, and sort of get the, the outcomes we want to achieve. We just have to talk to each other about it. So that's how we start. <laughs> That'd be nice. That's my cousin who's going <laughs> to... You talk about land trusts in, within a uh, neighborhood or, or an area. Would that cause kind of micro-segregation where the, the land trust houses, I don't even know how many they would be, would be segregate, might be a different nationality or group of people than the other houses or residents in that area? Yeah, I guess it could, but I don't know of any land trusts that have enough properties that it would actually impact an entire neighborhood. You know, they usually have sort of scattered sites. They have some over here and some over here. Um, they don't usually, you know, sort of take over the whole neighborhood because they can't, they can't acquire that much land. And, um, and the land trust uh, homeowners are diverse also. You know, they might in different neighborhoods have different... Um, like we said, like different focuses for who they're trying to help, but um, I don't know of that happening. I, I think maybe that would be like a, a, not a good outcome, but it would mean that they're actually having this huge impact, which uh, they, they aren't quite yet in any one neighborhood. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Laura Owen and I'm with Santa Cruz Community Credit Union and I'm really Great. glad I'm here and I just wanted to make a statement because it's like mind opening, you know. Um, I was just at, um, during Juneteenth, I was like, I need to get out there more. I'm from Jamaica so I'm like here learning new things and I'm like, I've been here a long time but like Juneteenth and I'm like getting absorbed and I was at a place, I had just come, I do a lot of financial literacy in the community and I worked for another credit union before for like 20 years and then I moved to this one so I was telling them all what I'm doing and how I can support them and it was a group of um, black people right and I was there and I was telling them how I can help with the financial literacy and I heard the need about the payday lender somebody shared an example of needing to move into renting a place they didn't have the money and they paid um, borrowed 25 and paid 7,000 my heart dropped you know because that's what I try to help people not to do because credit unions are there even banks can help you more than not even not even just credit unions to save and then the conversation went on to where they were talking about the possibility of getting a big land and have a, some, a lot of tiny homes on it. Mm -hmm. And we rent it for like cheaper prices and save up. And they didn't care about the space. They don't have, need big spaces, but they want to have at least a little yard, you know? And then they could move to a, eventually we come up with a plan. So when I heard about the land, I said, no, I know I need to do more research. And I know I can help to start a movement with a lot of great people in this room. And basically, they were talking about the little tiny homes. And then you would eventually, we come up with a plan, because I'm now a financial, certified financial counselor, so I can help them to, from point A to point B. I do it already, but now I'm certified. And we were talking about saving that money and then eventually be able, and we talk about other programs, and I mentioned you to Elaine to them, and about the, the, house, the deadline and stuff. So I mentioned some resources that I knew. But it makes me, so the other day, somebody asked, 
asked me about an investment and that I to come up with the idea and I sent them my Google tiny houses on big you know mm -hmm. and I sent them an image it was a doctor and he had some money to invest I'm like I sent it <laughs> I don't know where it was going and then I went to the bank and somebody said to me you're like wait would that be commercial land or private land you know mm -hmm. so what I'm saying I'm glad I'm here today <laughs> and I'm glad to know that it's, it doesn't feel impossible anymore it didn't feel impossible to me but now I feel like I have a calling Mm -hmm. And I feel like more people in the room are having the same feeling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I feel like we should partner and do something similar and model other cities or other places and do more. And you mentioned Hispanics and we're at Santa Cruz Credit Union. The, it's very mission specific and it mentioned Hispanics in there. And I was like, wait, mm -hmm. where's my peeps? But anyways, mm -hmm. it, it's like it, it starts somewhere, right? And then we could work together and achieve this. And um, I Googled it and they look pretty cool. And it was like... Say, um, I don't know how many acres, but I'm like, a, and they, they weren't, they had enough space between them and they mm -hmm. were cute and it's livable and we could start there and then eventually work with Elaine. We work with other people in the mm -hmm. com community to get, and then we start one and then the story spreads and we make it work. I don't know yeah. all the details, but I'm empowered by being here today. Great. And I thank you and I'm definitely gonna buy that book. Great. How do people get in touch with you? <laughs> So everyone go find her at the Santa Cruz Community Credit Union. Start a movement. <laughs> and we would just want to thank you again for your support. Of yeah, this thank you. <laughs> she does raise a good point because one of the things I was wondering is in all the land trusts you find, while not compulsory, is there financial education, you know, wealth management, financial? Because otherwise, if, if it's a point... I bought a house or I have a house, that's it, and maybe I take the equity and bounce, that doesn't, that doesn't train for wealth generation, which is really the end goal, right? Because yeah. the solutions we're talking about here, that's good now, but this is three, four, five generations worth of work that has yeah. to be done. Yeah, that's a good point. Many land trusts have, uh, you know, home ownership, it's called home ownership education and counseling to help folks who... Uh, you know, maybe haven't owned a home before, or maybe their parents didn't own a home, so they weren't taught sort of the ins and outs of home ownership. Also, uh, many land trust home buyers uh, receive some kind of public support. Um, they get a, you know, first time home buyer mortgage or down payment assistance grant, and those usually come with a requirement that the recipient goes through a home ownership education and counseling program. And we talk about those kinds of programs in Just Action also, and we profile a group in Portland that found they were giving home buyer assistance and found that even though their target population contained you know, a good proportion of African Americans, their clientele, the people buying houses out of their program weren't very many African Americans, and they started to investigate why. And they ended up developing a, a specific home ownership education course taught by and for black home buyers. And it really increased their numbers. You know, they could talk about their own experiences, relate to each other, create networks of people who own homes in their communities that they could then uh, work with. So another uh, way to address that. And one other thing, um, uh, my next Substack column will be about this, but the intergenerational transfer of wealth through home ownership and having estate plans and wills in place is an important, vital piece of this puzzle because you can buy a home and accumulate wealth and then it won't be transferred the way you want it to unless you have a will or a state plan and many um, communities of color don't have much of this kind of planning, especially people who have in, you know land in their family from generations and generations ago. So I think these programs that provide home ownership education and counseling should have a requirement that their recipients have an estate plan and a will in place um, for them to get that uh, assistance. So that's, there's so many pieces, it's, you know, you start to dig into this and there's just so many things that have an impact and can have a positive impact if we address them. Okay, I'd like to ask our AV guys, um, did we get anything in the chat? No questions from the virtual audience. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ken Smith. Uh, thanks to you and your dad for writing this book. Um, I'm wondering if you and your dad have been tracking the reparations discussion in California, and are you uh, optimistic? Uh, and what, if any, impact do you see because of the way it's being structured that it might have on this discussion? And then secondly, not about this topic, but I'm curious what comments you have about writing a book with your dad. So. <laughs> I was waiting for that one. <laughs> 
Well, you ask what me and my dad think about the reparations, and we have different answers. So because I'm here, I'll give you my answer. <laughs> um, I think it is a hopeful um, step in this whole discussion that we are having a conversation about reparations. It means that we're reckoning with the past in a way that we never have. If we're able to put some monetary value on the you know, the harm that's been caused, it means we're actually reckoning with the harm that's been caused, which hasn't happened before. Um, now, I don't know if the recommendations coming out of the reparations task force in California or San Francisco are realistic. And um, we uh, are, we're careful in writing just action to not use the term reparations because I think it comes with a risk of, you know, adopting one one program or one remedy, maybe one payout, and then you call it a reparations and it sounds like we're done. Like, you know, we've repaired the harm, we can be done with this now, and it's not gonna work like that. So we use uh, the term remedies instead because we're gonna need many, many remedies, and it's not only financial remedies, it's also changing policy um, that continues to perpetuate these systems. And so, so that's, you know, I won't channel my dad and answer how he would answer, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it's a both and. I think it's um, hopeful and I think it's a step in the right direction. I'm not sure what it will lead to here in California, but I think the conversation itself is good. And then we should continue to look at the many, many remedies we can enact that um, will impact the entire reparations conversation. And your second question about writing a book with my dad. Um, it actually, so I, uh, I, it took him a while to convince me to write a book with him, if I'm honest. I wasn't sure how it would go. I've never worked with my dad before. Um, it ended up being a really wonderful experience. Um, we worked really well together. It was surprisingly easeful. And it was, I think, for both of us, an interesting experience to get a, a closer look at each other's sort of professional worlds and outlooks and I we had some some topics that we just like couldn't agree on and a lot of it was I think a generational way of talking about these issues he he's you know been doing this for a long time he's a stubborn guy and he can you know and he's been talking about this the way he's been talking about this for 60 years and things have changed and so I tried to make sure that we took account of that as much as we could. But it's also, you know, he has been talking about this for 60 years, so I really got a, um, even broader sort of respect for what he's done. And, and working with him on this book and traveling around the country talking about it, just seeing up close the impact he's had on the, the country and, you know, big picture stuff. We talked to legislators who have given the book to all of their colleagues in a state legislator, legislature and individual people who've changed their life course because they read The Color of Law and were inspired to do something different with their lives. So for me personally, it's been really uh, a cool experience to get to see that um, part of my dad's life and the impact he's had. So. <laughs> and you could tell him I said that. <laughs> All right, we have to save some sign for a book signing. Yeah. Maybe one more question or comment? What's uh, next? What's next? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm writing this as long as people want to hear me talk about it. So for now, that's into next year, and we'll see uh, what happens. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how best to use this platform to really connect people with groups that are working on these issues and to make it a uh, real, you know, not just people leave being like, wow, that's great, we can do something, and then it fizzles out. You know, I really want to use this to advance the actual work, which actually brings up another point. There's a group that was formed out of the color of law that my dad helped start that's now independent of him called the Redress Movement. It's a national organization that is placing organizers and communities around the country to help continue these conversations and create organizing campaigns. So you can check them out at redressmovement.org. They currently have organizers in Denver, Milwaukee, and Charlotte. And they're looking at adding a couple more um, cities. So there is stuff happening all over and just trying to figure out how best to support all of that and feed people into it. That's about as much as I know about what's next okay. for me. <laughs> well, we're going to squeeze in one more, and then we're okay.
I just, Elaine Johnson, I'm the Executive Director of Housing Santa Cruz County and also the President of the NAACP. And it's good to be here this evening. And I just wanna, it's, it's nice to be sitting in this room talking about this. Mm -hmm. it, it's a conversation that doesn't happen that often in Santa Cruz County. Mm -hmm. And I, <laughs> <laughs> amen. <Yeah>. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I, you know, when the, the young woman was talking about, you know, housing on campus, and I mean, Santa Cruz, as, as everybody knows, we're, the, the, we're at the top of the list now, the most affordable, the most expensive place in the nation, rental market, the whole nine. And, you know, all, what I can say is, you know, if, if we showed up here, there's something in our hearts that, want, that wants a shift, right? But, um, you know, something I find that is so extremely important is the narratives that are being told. It is the narratives that are a big barrier to why we're not building homes, mm -hmm. right? And so it's, it's time to shift those narratives. I'm always encouraging people to, wh whatever story you hear, and if it don't ring true, don't repeat it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, because, be, because a big part of what you're talking about with people that look like me that don't get rented to because there's these narratives about the, what we're gonna do, we ain't gonna do what we're gonna bring, right. which is so far from the truth. Right. And so I wanna commend, again, Bookshop Santa Cruz, hey. <laughs> you know, they've really been stepping it up in, um, in bringing this awareness. Mm. And actually, it's not even, it's more than awareness. It's, it's bringing the action here to Santa Cruz County so we can start really moving the needle yeah. in, in making about some, some significant changes in here. So thank you for being Great. here this thank evening. Thank you, thanks for coming, yeah. Thank you. All right. Find some books. So Leah's going to go down to that table.